Let us all delight in the Lord and his law. Let us all delight in the Lord we adore. Let us all delight in the Lord of life. Let us all delight in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Servant Podcast. I hope you've been having a great day. And I appreciate you tuning in, and I'm always blessed to be able to sit down and record another uh, study of some things that I've been looking through and that I think are helpful to uh, other Christians as well, because really we're trying to be more Christ-like in our day-to-day life. Um, We search the Scriptures, that's our authority. We're trying to listen to what God wants us to hear and practice it, put it into practice as we listen to the, what His words are in, in the Bible. So this this year we've been looking at intentionality. I hope you've been joining in, uh, looking last month of February at being more intentional with our Bible study. This month of March we've been discussing intentional listening. Uh, the first week of March we talked about the idea Sometimes when we're in social situations or uh, with our family or our church family, there's almost this instinct for us to, you know, prefer to speak, or at least for me, maybe I'm assuming that on you. I know people that uh, they prefer to sit back and listen, and they're good listeners. Uh, So that's what we're talking about the first week of March, is this idea of when we prefer to speak, we prefer to talk about ourselves and about what's going on in our lives and what's going on with our beliefs and and almost to the neglect of listening to another person. And it goes either way. You know, that person that prefers to listen, there's a balance there. You know, they can listen so much, but they need to be able to converse and talk and tell about themselves. So then the second week of March, we looked at awkwardness in conversation. We talked about the engagement with strangers. Uh, sometimes it is scary because there's a lot of thoughts that flood our mind. It's, you know, what are they, what are they going to think about me? What if I say something dumb? What if I say something offensive? I don't want to offend them. So it's almost better that if I just don't engage. And we talked about how awkward it can be. And, you know, the best thing to be is when we do engage, we just need to be genuine. We need to show them who we are rather than just tell them, this is who I am, this is who everybody around me perceives me to be. Let's just just be yourself. And I know it can be hard, but just be yourself and and show them who you are. This week, I wanted to think about, um, you know, through my life and through a lot of experiences I've I've went through, I've heard a lot about this topic, and maybe you have too, but we're going to look at the topic of considering feelings you know, feelings in particular. So we want to be able to consider someone's feelings. We want to think about them, don't we? Uh, maybe we don't. You know, that's that's all the more reason let's talk about it for a few minutes here today. I would say, and I would argue, that in relationships, whether that's a husband and wife, a boyfriend, girlfriend, parent, child, a mentor or in their student, even it comes down to with the Lord and his disciple. In those relationships, feelings matter. And almost if we start to anywhere in any way dismiss feelings, I think that would be foolish. So how does intentional listening, how do the, how does that practice take feelings into consideration? And that's what we're going to look at. How do we view feeling, especially as a Christian, and feelings? Do feelings matter? That's the first thing. Do feelings matter? As I said just a minute ago, almost to our detriment, if we start to dismiss feelings, that's foolish. So to ignore feelings, let's let's say I'm feeling a certain way, and I just ignore it, I don't address it, and I suppress it. To ignore that? That's that's an a that's a trait, that's a characteristic of someone who is emotionally unhealthy. Uh I guess the professional world calls it denial. And for example, you know, I'm sad. Uh let's say I lost a loved one. They just passed away. 
and I'm terribly grieving this because I was so close to this person. But, you know, everybody at church, every time I go there, they ask me, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm great. Yeah, yeah, I feel, I think I'm over it. I'm pretty well over all that, and uh, I mean, I'm still, I hate that they're gone, but I'm good. I'm great. That's, if that's not the truth, and we just take that feeling of grief or sadness and we just suppress it, that's terribly unhealthy for us to do. And that's what's called denial. And usually, not all the time, but usually that person that's in denial of their feelings is the same person that will project that inner feeling that they're denying. They'll project that onto other people. You know, use that example, that illustration. I lost a loved one. I'm, I am really grieved about it, but I'm telling every, everyone I'm not. I'm good. I'm going to turn around and say, hey, are you sad? You know, or you look down. Every, every, every avenue I see to almost capitalize on that, if someone isn't smiling, if someone really does look down, and maybe they are down, I'll, I'll, I'll be more aware of that because that's the way I feel. And I'll start to project that onto other people. Hey, is are you going through a hard time right now? Uh, so we gotta be we gotta be healthy emotionally as Christians because there's a balance. We cannot dismiss feelings completely, but we cannot be fully engulfed in I feel this way, and I'm I'm just I'm in my feelings all the time, and it's great. So <clears throat> when we're conversating with others, when we're talking to people. Let's keep in mind that every person deals with things differently. And asserting that your way is superior is dangerous, and it is downright disgusting. It puts a nasty taste in people's mouth. When, let's say, someone's feeling a certain way, and you come in, and you already have solutions, and instead of listening to the way they feel, you have already begun asserting that, you know, let's say, Josh, you lost a loved one. Yeah, you know what? Everybody loses loved ones. Wow, that's great. I well, appreciate that. You know, uh, uh, you know what? What I'm gonna my reaction to that is I don't want to really even be around you if you're not gonna have that empathetic listening, em- emphatic listening. I guess uh, having that empathy toward me and what I'm feeling at that moment. So in times of struggle, feelings matter. Being empathetic matters. Uh, think about sometimes when you've struggled with things. Times that you have really downright struggled, maybe with your spiritual health, your mental health, uh, your physical health, feelings that could be tied to struggle. Let's think of a few. Maybe low self-esteem. That's personal to me, I'll be honest. Uh, What about anxiousness or fear, uh, being afraid of something, or grief, like like we mentioned a moment ago? There are a lot of, there's a host of feelings that you can have when you're struggling, and we need to make sure, should we always, let's say, let's say we have people struggling around us, should we always just be ready to supply them with solutions? Oh, you're feeling this way. Oh, go turn over to Psalm 37, verse 4. You know, God's going to give you the desire of your heart. If you delight in his law, you shouldn't be down. You need to delight in God's law, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You'll find solutions. We need to sometimes slow down. And we, we're trying to be mature. And I'm not saying I have, you know, whether or not I've responded in perfect ways in the past. I, I can admit that I probably haven't. But we need to slow down and make sure that we're not always just, you know, the fixers in every situation. Someone feels a certain way, let's talk or just be with them. Job's friends, they were probably, you know, the best times of of them being an actual friend or those first seven days where they were silent. And who knows what their feelings were at them in that time either. They were trying to process. That's a good practice. They were trying to think, you know, this was Job. This was our friend. What happened? How can we be a friend for him now? And that's when it started shifting. You know, they, they probably started thinking of solutions for Job and the solution they arrived at was Job was a downright sinner and he needed to repent of something. And we can get that we can get that way too. We need to make sure we're approaching people that are struggling with their feelings with empathy. Uh what about what about in personal matters? What how can we become better at discerning? Here here's a huge one. 
discerning whether someone's coming to us to release information or they're looking for solutions. I guess that release information, if we put a modern term on it, it would be to rant. And I, you can reach out to me and we can discuss this further. I don't necessarily think it's uh, morally wrong to rant, but there's a balance with it. So, but in those matters, how can we be good Christians and be good people at discerning whether or not, okay, this person's just trying to let their feelings out, trying to cope with these, trying to just, maybe they're feeling overwhelmed or uncertain or confused or curious about something. And they're just coming to you to let everything out. We need to know whether that's the case or if they're coming to me for counsel or advice. And I need to ask that. I just need to be honest and ask, hey, are you, what are you wanting from me? Do you want me to be a soundboard or do you want me to try to help you work through this with solutions? Lastly, I think uh, feelings do matter. And the third thing I wanted to bring in was religious discussion. How can we become better at affirming what we believe? You know, whether what if we're talking to someone that differs in our in religious beliefs? Can we stomach the thought of setting still and listening and every moment that we know we agree with them? Take note of that. Affirm that to them. You know, I'm right there with you on that. And finding that common ground, that will help cultivate a good soil to go forth when you're planting the seed. How can we become better at listening in a way of what, you know, whether someone says, you know, I had a personal experience with God and and he's worked many great things in my life. Well, you know, it depends on what you mean and that needs to be qualified further. But we need to think, wow, this person really loves God and they are trying to, you know, seek God. They really do want to have a relationship with God instead of saying, no, miraculous is, you know, it's ceased or, or whatever our, our, uh, programmed responses would be. We need to be sure we're affirming and, and finding common ground. And, and, you know, in, in religious discussion, there can be feelings of confidence. There can be feelings of unsurety or doubt or skepticism, or even presumptuous feelings, presuming that you know where they're going or what they're about to say. And that's not necessarily wrong, but that shouldn't be applied to every conversation, especially right off the bat. But we need to we need to work our feelings out as we're going through those discussions too and, and assess them properly. So giving a quick and easy response, whether you're... In each of those uh, um, circumstances, in struggle, in personal things, or religious discussion, giving a quick and easy answer or response, it's just plain lazy. And it takes the meaning out of what bearing one another, bearing with one another is. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2, it says if, uh, in verse 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So we need to be sure that we're always, you know, we're not just trying to fix everybody else. We need to make sure we're respecting their feelings. You know, we talk to them, communicate. There is a level of respect when we are kind and t- kind enough to think about what someone's feeling. They're feeling a certain way. They're bringing that to you. Listen to it. Respect it. Because whether you like it or not, you bring your feelings to whoever you talk to. Uh, you feel a certain you feel certainty when it comes to talking truth to someone. Well, you're bringing that feeling of confidence and certainty to that conversation. What if you're sad? You're taking that feeling of sadness to whoever you're you're grieving with and you're expecting a level of respect from them. That's the second thing, is respect for one another's feelings. Uh, There in Galatians 6 and verse 1, it says, looking to yourself. Is that, I wonder, 
because he starts there. Paul starts at, at verse one. Even if uh, it says, "If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness." Each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. I wonder, maybe you can reach out and tell me your thoughts on this. I wonder if that aspect of looking to yourself or self-examination, is that what allows someone or promotes someone to be considered spiritual? Because I would say, and I would argue that if we're if we're always looking at everybody else's faults and saying, you know, you need to be fixed in this area, that area, and the, and we neglect that self-examination. We probably are not spiritual. That's what I think the Bible would define as immature. And we have to love one another as ourselves, and that means that if we have enough self-love to examine our own faults, we will not always maximize or ever maximize the fault of others as if they're worse than ours. So we need to respect what people are bringing us in conversation, respect their feelings, respect their convictions. Respect for a person is not always approval. We need to get that right. We need to understand that. Respect is something that is on, that should be innate in our nature, having respect for a human being and, and listening and communicating in proper ways. So the third thing I wanted to mention and then we'll we'll close on this. Third thing is, <clears throat> does God take mankind's feelings into consideration? Does God himself take mankind's feelings into consideration? Be- because when it comes to our religious beliefs, our convictions should be backed by emotional ties. We should be emotionally tied to what we believe in. I, it doesn't matter... What your belief is, if you're not, if you don't have zeal, if you don't have love, if you don't, if you're not motivated by uh, thankfulness and and of the grace that you've received, then you're probably not emotionally healthy or spiritual healthy, spiritually healthy. If we're emotionally unhealthy, what will that say about the practice of our convictions? If we can't be in tune with what we feel and why. How will that be reflected in the practice of our beliefs, our, our religious practice? Not just hearing the word, but doing it. We need to remember God does take mankind's feeling in, into consideration because he has emotions. God has emotions. Man has emotions because we were created, created in the image of God. God cares about what we feel. He does. He cares about what we feel. Or he wouldn't ask. If he didn't care, he would not ask. And in 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, um, or verse 7, well, verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that you may exalt, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling. Anxiety is a feeling. Casting all of it on him because he cares for you. If he didn't care about what we're feeling, and all what we're getting bogged down with, he wouldn't ask for it. So do we ask? Do we not ask each other about our feelings because we just don't care, or we simp- we just like to elevate facts in order to disregard feelings? Because I think it's often what I mean by that. Oftentimes, we say, you know, facts don't care about your feelings, or you know, your feelings don't matter. Jeremiah 17, 9 is the verse we throw out. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Don't follow your heart. Well, it's almost like a a total disregard for what you're feeling in that moment. And I think, like I said, my, my religious beliefs are backed by certain emotions such as love for God, um, love for what he's done. Uh, gentleness, kindness, thankfulness, all of these things are, are are how I feel, and that's what's backed by the facts, and there's a balance. I'm not disregarding facts over uh, uh, over feelings. I'm just saying we need to balance this correctly. Feelings do not negate facts. Proper use of opportunities and facts give us 
and emotional balance. And I want to I want to illustrate this in First Thessalonians three. First Thessalonians three, uh, starting in verse five. Um, so in Acts chapter seventeen, Paul and and his companions were in Thessalonica. They were run out of the city fairly quickly, and and later on, Paul writes back because he's concerned about them. He is worried. He is fearful for them and their faith. And so there are things that we can we can properly cope with our feelings in certain ways, and there are things that we have to do to do that. But our feelings matter, and they need coping. So in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, Paul says, For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I also sent to find out about your faith. For fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, just as we long to see you, for that reason, he says, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted. That's a feeling. So the question is, does God take mankind's feelings into consideration? Do feelings matter, especially when in conversation? I think they do. We should never elevate feelings over facts. We should never disregard feelings for the sake of throwing out facts. But there needs to be a proper coping of certain feelings so that we can be physically, mentally, and spiritually balanced so just as Paul here, he did what he could. He did every effort he could to cope with his feelings. He was fearful for the Thessalonicans' faith. So what did he do? He didn't just sit there in his fear and mope. He didn't allow that to dry, uh, to encapsulate him. He allowed that to drive him to opportunities and find solutions. He said, I sent Timothy because I needed to, I needed a solution to this feeling. So... When it comes to our personal conversation, we need to we need to be considerate of what people are telling us how they feel. We need to we need to realize they matter. We need to know that we're not always the solution makers, but God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, and we can search his scriptures and see that a respect for one's feelings matter and that God takes into consideration everyone's feelings. So we need to be balanced, and that comes from study of his word. If there's anything I I can do for you, reach out. If there's any concerns, comments, questions, don't neglect uh, reaching out, and I'd love to talk to you. Everybody have a great week, and God bless you.